Thanks, Gillian. Um, do we have... Uh, Yes, we have, have some slides, great. Um, so thank you, Julian, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, as, as uh, both uh, int introducers have said, we are gonna take a slightly different slant uh, for the next, uh, half, next half hour, uh, because what's great about conferences like this is being able to hear from the real experts in all of the different kind of disciplines that are driving uh, change and disruption. Um, what we tend to hear less from in these types of, e of events is the customers themselves. So, that's what we're going to try and do. We're going to bring the voice of the customer onto these screens, and it um, just happens that um, these particular cu customers have lived a little way into the future. So, before I introduce them, I'm just going to explain a little bit about why we think this is so important. Um, because we've been tracking Australian CX capabilities for a few years now at Starcom, um, and we've also been tracking the customer's view, so how well our customers rate us at what, uh, the experiences we create. Um, and for all of the improvements and the acceleration in marketing CX technology, personalization, and automation um, over the last few years, customer expectations continue to accelerate faster than our ability as an industry to keep pace with them. Um, to the extent that last year, when we surveyed CX professionals, they rated themselves 106% better at creating great experience than customers did. Yeah. Over twice as good. That's kind of important, because what we also track is the business impact of moving from good to great customer experience. Uh, and that's when we start to get into the realms of exponential um, in improvements, both in brand preference and in customer loyalty, up to 10 times the impact in moving from a good experience to a great experience. So, when we think about the disruptive technology coming through both voice, um, AI, and the Internet of Things, the profound acceleration in the number of devices that each of us are going to have in our homes um, over, the, over the coming years, that repre re represents a bit of a tipping point in the types of experiences that we can create for our customers. So, first point that we, uh, we started to think about was, how do we predict what people will want a couple of years from now? Now, actually predicting how technology will, cha will change behavior, well, it shouldn't be that difficult. Um, technology does accelerate at a fairly predictable rate. It's just that that rate is uh, exponential rather than linear. Um, we see ourselves, uh, we see this really as the, st uh, the start of the third revolution, the third connected era uh, caused by, by, by the digital revolution. First one, of course, being the web itself. Uh, the link revolution, um, computers connected by the internet. Second one, the social revolution, people, social graph, people connected by smartphones. The third one, the third revolution of smart devices connected by intelligent agents is already upon us. Um, and while the first couple um, created relatively small amount of disruption over the first five years of their, um, uh, um, of their, uh, their era, as mass, um, and mass adoption um, took uh, the new technologies to relatively even distribution. Um, the significant disruption happened uh, over the second five years. How many of us, for instance, would have thought about, uh, in, in 2007, about getting into a stranger's ta uh, car rather than a taxi, or booking a holiday in uh, someone else's house? rather than the hotel. But the platforms built on that second revolution, uh, the likes of uh, Uber, of Airbnb, of Netflix, have disrupted, uh, disrupted categories um, 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 over, over the last five to 10 years. So, technology is changing at a, at a predictable rate. The revolutions are caused by where technology interacts with us, with messy, illogical, socially influenced, irrational human beings. Um, so, when we started look, um, looking at the impact of, uh, of CX and the impact of technology on creating great experience, uh, we naturally looked to the countries in which technology is a little way ahead of us. Um, as you know, we've been doing a little bit this morning, uh, looking to what happens in the US, uh, in Japan, in the UK. Um, and we were surprised actually to find out that relatively little study into human uh, take on uh, experience of technology really exists. Um, so, it kind of makes sense. You know, prediction 
is hard, especially about the future. It's very difficult to ask people how they will uh, feel and think differently uh, in four or five years' time because the change is so profound, people don't really understand. They find it really difficult to comprehend. When we ran focus groups, people were just really thinking that the future is going to be like now, just a bit faster. We realised that the only way that we can uh, actually predict what will happen in 2023 is to go there and to spend time with real people interacting with technology and then to report back on what happened. So that's what we're going to do now. So I generally find that people fall into one of two camps when they think about the future of connected living. It seems you're either a Jetsons person or you're a Black Mirror person. But regardless of where you sit, I think one thing we can all agree on is that thinking about how we'll live in the future is incredibly fascinating. The big opportunity with this piece of work was being able to create a future today and then delve into it to see what we could learn about what people would be doing and how they would be feeling. So we decided fairly early on that it would be important to do this within the context of people's real homes and their real lives, because this would be the way that we could understand how their real needs, challenges, wants and fears would play out in that environment. We wanted to give people the feeling that they had been transported into the future. To do this, we created four of the smartest, most connected homes in Australia, if not the world. These homes were tailored to the individual interests and needs of those families. And it involved everything from installing smart fridges to vacuum cleaners, smart washing machines, smart entertainment, lighting, security, doorbells, everything that we could put into those homes to really create that experience of future living. We also asked our participants to try and strive to live towards a set of future living goals. We wanted them to think about the different ways that they did chores, organised their families, looked after their health, and to see if they could stretch themselves into the future. When we did all of those things, we really created an experience that was fundamentally different to their current way of living. Then over a period of six weeks, we interacted with those families. We observed how their behaviours naturally changed, we set them a few tasks, and our ethnographers went in on a weekly basis to interview them on video. That's what we'll be looking at today. So people are really at the heart of this project and absolutely crucial to its success. The first phase of our research was a panel of 36 households that we engaged through qualitative research. Choosing the four future living families from that panel was really a mixture of art and science. So we weren't setting out to create a reality TV show here. There weren't any auditions, but we did have a couple of guiding principles. The first was that we wanted to reflect the diversity and complexity of Australian family life. So we looked at four different types of households. We had urban millennials, working families, multi-generational families living under one roof, as well as retirees. We also made sure to have a spectrum of technological competence within those households. So families that essentially had one or two smartphones, all the way up to those that were dabbling already in connected home technology. But I think the best way really to understand our families is to let them introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Ben, Um, I'm 43 years old. Got a young family. If I watch Netflix, it only lasts for half an hour because I fall asleep because there's so many things to do with the chores. This is the first like proper house before we're in an apartment, so yeah. we're really loving this house. Me and my husband both work from home. We just do our best to be a part of the community. I'm Ronald, uh, this is my partner Kevin. Just in case, press a button, away you go. That's what I like. My favourite thing about my house is probably the Wi-Fi. I like to watch memes. We can do this. No, Marcy, watch this. OK, Google. Turn off the TV. Yeah. OK, turning off the TV. Television guy, television guy. Print it on paper. Print it on paper. It's a real thing. So 
So we were lucky enough to find four very real families who generously led us into their lives for a number of weeks. As you can imagine, a study that's designed to understand the future of living on this scale really yields a wealth of insights, from big social, cultural implications, all the way through to quite a granular understanding of how everyday behaviours and routines around things like organisation or shopping or chores or health will change. Today we're going to focus on three key areas that really underpin the idea of an expectation revolution and that are relevant to every single person in this room. First of all, looking at how connected living changes the way we relate to our homes and our expectations of brands. Then we'll look at how voice plays a really critical role in creating trust and why it's more important than ever in this environment to be a trusted business. Finally, we'll look at how the accelerating expectations around service impact on the banking and payments industry. So let's start with this idea of intuitive agents. There is a lot of buzz out there about artificial intelligence, about computers churning vast amounts of data to optimise outcomes for us. But when we had four families living in smart homes, we found that this idea of an intelligent agent went to a completely different level. I'm sure a few of you are sitting in the audience sort of wondering, how much difference can this really make? automatically turning on and off a few lights, setting your robovac to run or opening your front door? And it's a fair question. It's based on your personal experience of having just a few of these Internet of Things devices in your own homes. But what we found really remarkable is that when we went from a few devices in a home all the way up to 50, 60 plus over the course of a weekend, it completely changed people's perceptions of their home. When everything's working together, people stop seeing their homes as a collection of devices performing individual actions, and they start seeing instead a complete smart ecosystem, a fully gestalt experience of future living. And people found smart living to be both easier and richer. They felt more comfortable, better organised, healthier, they even felt smarter, and they developed a completely different mindset about interacting with their home. Of course, voice is the gateway to smart living, and it was the technology that all of our households adopted literally within hours of it being installed in their homes. And that's because voice is the most natural way for humans to, to communicate. If you think about the way you interact with technology at the moment, you're swiping, you're scrolling, you're clicking, you're typing, none of that's particularly natural, and it really brings forward that rational, conscious part of our brain. Voice really is far more intuitive and natural it brings forward that emotional, subconscious part of our brain. And if you think about how we're used to using our voice, we're used to using our voice to interact with other humans. So when we start interacting with technology using our voice, then we start to believe that that technology really has a personality. Alexa, Radio 2CH 11.70. Yes. Alexa, turn on study light. With the light in the study, you're going to have our girlfriend turn everything off. You call her your, your girlfriend. She's doing OK at the moment, but when she does, I've got a lot of other things too. <laughs> we even find ourselves, you know, when it's done, thank you, Alexa. <laughs> so she's part of the family now. Hi, Bigsby. What is the weather for tomorrow? Hmm. I can't determine your current location. Oh, Let's take a look at what's inside the fridge. <laughs> she's going crazy. Have you contemplated turning Bixby off? No, because I like I still like to know because it means the fridge is dead. If you turn Bixby off, then the fridge is just the fridge. But if Bixby's there, then she's alive. Some of those were actually filmed within the first week or so of, uh, of the experiment. The voices were very quickly referred to as people. And actually, as um, families learnt more uh, about how to get them uh, to control and work with their homes, um, they started to use words like butler, assistant, coach, as well as kind of girlfriend and alive. Um, but there's something that's more fundamental that changes once everything is connected and has a personality. Um, which is, not only do people stop seeing the voice as being, and, and, and the, the, stop seeing the devices as independent, they also stop seeing the voice as being part of Amazon or Google, or even residing in a speaker. They start to see the voice as the voice and the personality of their own home. 
that has a really profound impact on how they subconsciously and consciously uh, interact with it and with the information that it gives and the uh, impact it has on their expectations of what it should be able to do for them. It's your home, your personal space. It should know everything about you and be able to predict and intuit what you want. Um, so that really changes the expect people's expectations of what we should be able to accomplish through uh, the connected system. So when you think of smart tech, you don't think of still inputting things and touching things. You just think everything is voice activation. So I think voice activation is uh, probably an expectation. You know, so uh, voice activation with the with the Doris, with the, the fridge, we do activate it to turn it on, but then sort of like we have to get the remote, and we have to get two remotes. It's kind of like okay. Um, so organically for me, I remember when I was trying to figure it out, I was like I was a little bit frustrated. Um, but you know, like it would be nice if you could sort of then keep sort of talking to stuff. If I got it all down. Um, all the different commands and say everything was like um, available through voice activation. It would be pretty cool, you know. I'd feel like a different being. I feel empowered. Is the word. You feel like the king smart uh, coffee machine. We would have ideally liked is like, hey Google, turn on coffee machine. Hey Google, uh, prep cappuccino or make cappuccino. That's what we would have liked to see. There's a lot of ones that connect. Uh, is it with Wi-Fi, hun? Yes. The, the, yeah. Well, they the ones that but they weren't voice them. commands. We can do it with lights, or we can do it with our TV. Let's do it with our coffee machine as well. Also, yeah. choose. Do I want a cappuccino? Do I want an espresso? Do I want That's a short right. black? Or do I want a long black? But also, it's John when you're saying, "Hey Google, turn on coffee." So it's making the coffee. John's way. So if it's me yeah, saying my it, my favourite even. Yeah. You know, and it's like, hey, presto, it's Correct. starting your favourite. Yes. Does it interact with you like the barista would? Yes. Well, yeah, it's going to talk back to you. Sure, John, making your coffee now. See you downstairs or something. Now that we've got it, we want more. Yeah. We want it to be able to do things. Yeah. You know, and more and more. So we've only been able to talk to devices for a few years. Um, these guys had only had this system in their home for a few weeks, but already they've gone from switching on a light to expecting a barista in their home. <laughs> um, now, we couldn't actually give that to them. The hardware doesn't exist, but that is something to bear in mind when you are thinking about service design, um, that it is absolutely voice first in this ecosystem uh, and that it is using data in an incredibly powerful way to predict and intuit based on what it knows about you through all of the interactions that your home has had with you. It's our home, it should know. So because of that and um, kind of going back to what Nicole was talking about the power of voice on a subconscious level. Um, it also really changes what the concept of smart looks like in a smart home. And this is one of the really big surprises to, uh, to us in this, in this piece of research, that smart meant EQ just as much as IQ. Because, you know, when you think about the first thing that you do when you buy a smart speaker, it's really to perform tasks from the last era of connected devices. Uh, you're thinking about putting on a song, um, about uh, performing a search, about make, setting a reminder, it's admin, organisation, entertainment. Um, but what we found once there was the whole range of devices connected into a single, and let's face it, in 2019, still pretty basic intelligence, um, the, way that, the ways that our participants learnt to work with the technology, to connect it wider, to connect it more deeply into their lives, meant that they were able to accomplish goals around healthier living, around creating better family time, better family connection, even around how they set mood and how mood reacted to their home just through the use of, li of lighting, sound and fragrance. So when we think of smarter living, we shouldn't just default to practical and rational benefits, to kind of the, e the IQ version of smart. Um, we're also thinking about um, the, the potential for sort of more emotional EQ smarts. Um, so within that convergence of personality and technology, um, we really have the potential to create a new kind of experience in the home because that whole connected system 
is quite different to the experience of a single speaker connected to an Amazon or Google account. Um, but yeah, please do take your new speaker home and do that and start testing it out. But the first thing to do is try and connect it to something. Uh, because it, it, they, they, you, they suddenly start to make sense when they're connected to multiple devices. Um, being able to con uh, control many aspects of the home by voice did really lead participants to think that they were interacting with their home rather than the speaker. Um, and that feeling of connection led to a rapid acceleration of their expectations in what homes could do. Um, but really, for an, our key takeout on the the importance of intuitive agents is the companies, the devices, and the services that understand and preempt these, this, this sort of revolution and expectations are going to be the ones that are really best placed to, uh, to win over the next few years. Uh, and although we've heard some challenges around data and privacy this morning, I would also urge you all to think about the potential of, data, uh, of the data that, uh, that each, of, uh, each of you look after on behalf of your customers to create better pers uh, personalization um, and more intuitive opportunities. And the challenge that open banking is going to th and, and is, is thrown at you are opportunities to think about more collab collaboration in data. First point, though, and the key thing that uh, we, uh, key insight throughout the research is that for minimum viable smart, the expectation is that a service should be able to talk to you. Um, the speed that voice interaction was um, adopted in each of the four homes was matched by the central role that it played in all of the inflation exercises, all of the things that we can't currently do, but we asked our participants uh, to think about what they, what they would want in the future. And this is where shopping and paying, services that you can't really do because they're 2019 coming into a 2023 household, uh, started, uh, started to, to dramatically change uh, through the eyes of people who had lived in that home. Another thing that's really good about having Alexas all through the house now is shopping list, because so many times I had a Google Keep list before, but now I can just ask it to add something to the shopping list and then on the fly, wherever I am in the house, and then next time I go shopping, I know I'm not gonna miss like toothpaste or something like that. So that's definitely saved us a lot. Alexa, add milk to the shopping list. I've added milk to your shopping list. I can, or anyone can, talk faster than they can type. Search white shorts, pick billabong shorts, add to cart, check out, use PayPal, yeah. and done. Online buying with voice activation. So Nancy and John clearly have high expectations about the future of voice commerce. But what really surprised us is just how comfortable they seemed with this whole idea of shopping and paying using only their voices. There was an incredible amount of trust there. And the reason is that if we're having a conversation, everything that we know tells us that we're interacting with another human. And this really has a profound impact on the way that our brains process that information and make decisions based on that conversation. Humans really are hardwired to give each other the benefit of the doubt and to trust each other. So if a brand is able to have a voice in the home, then it's almost as if you're another personality in that home with whom someone can have an ongoing relationship. If a brand is going to do this really well, we need to think not just about how our voice sounds, sonic branding is incredibly important, not just about what you're saying, but also how you're behaving in that ongoing relationship. People don't want to be told what to do. They want to be coached towards their goals, they want to be encouraged, but at this point they still very much want to feel that they have the final decision. We've heard people talk about their smart home being like a personal assistant or a trainer, and the idea is that it's supposed to be helpful to them. The big opportunity here for brands is really that you're extending this part of the customer journey where you can have an ongoing intimate relationship with people in their homes. And by doing all of this, you help also to reinforce people's trust in your brand. Of course, the expectation that services going into the home won't only be on demand but also intuitive raises a lot of serious questions about data and privacy. And in our original panel of 36 households, people were as privacy and data literate as you would expect. They raised a lot of questions about how their personal data would be handled and protected in connected homes. But once our four families had an experience of living in their home, their perspective started to change. 
Very quickly, they were looking for more opportunities to share more personal data with their home, on the condition that that would make their home smarter, more personalised and more intuitive. There was a very clear willingness from the families to engage in a value exchange. And at this point in time, when the records of Internet of Things companies are relatively unblemished, our feeling is that people will continue to be willing to share that data for the right incentive. So what are the impl implications here? Well, the expectation is, first of all, that brands and services going into homes will use what they know about its inhabitants to predict their needs. The expectation is also that predicting these needs will be seamless. People don't want to know what's going on in the back end or the difficulties that we're having as businesses. In this era of open data, they expect brands and businesses to be collaborating behind the scenes to make things happen for them effortlessly. From our point of view, that's also going to mean that we need to rethink how we view collaboration or cooperation between businesses. I guess open banking is the first use case of this in Australia, but this is the right point in time to start thinking about how that goes beyond banking and extends into useful partnerships with other industries. Trust is, of course, the other big consideration here. Only the most trusted brands will be let into the hearts and minds of people's homes. So you need to make sure that you continue to build the trust in your brand. The final important thing to think about is which brand or business will be sitting in that central position as the trusted intuitive agent in the home. Will it be a company that already wins in a connected age? Could it be an Amazon or an Apple? Could it be someone like a retailer? We've seen Woolworths start to look at their business model again and start using the data they have on consumers in a different way. Or could it be a financial services company? If it's not your business that's sitting in that central position, then you need to give serious thought to how you will work with the business that does sit in that position. Let's take a look now at how these rapidly accelerating, ex accelerating expectations around service in the smart era will impact on banking and payments. Back in the day, we all enjoyed personal service from a teller when we'd go into our local branch. The slight downside of this was that depending on their mood, the level of service could vary a little bit. Fast forward and technology liberated us into an era of self-service. We could be our own bank manager. We could do everything with online banking wherever, wherever and whenever we wanted to. But let's face it, being your own bank manager, as well as your own travel agent and your own household procurement officer, really brings a heavy mental load. In the not-too-distant future, it's going to be about my smart home acting as my personal assistant to make these things happen for me, to do these tasks without me having to ask and free up my time to do things that I would prefer to be doing. We're going to be returned to a world of service, but this time it will be staffed by intelligent agents, and the expectation of those agents is that they know everything and they are perfect, unlike humans. That's what we're talking about with hyperservice, a level of service that's more personalised, more relevant and more intuitive than we've seen before. From a business point of view, of course, creating hyperservice is a huge challenge. It requires a level of personalisation that our technology can't currently create. I think the good news is that we're looking at hyperservice as an expectation for tomorrow. But what businesses can do is start thinking about how you make that come to life today. Now, I'm not a technical guru, but I can tell you from a human perspective a couple of things you need to think about. First of all, it's the idea about the value exchange we've been talking about already. People will share more data with their home in order to get something in return. So your role is to think about what does hyperservice mean in your industry and for your customers? What are the types of services that you can provide that will make people willing and interested in sharing their data with you? What you're aiming to do is really to make people's lives easier, make them richer, and also show them that you really understand their needs. So practically, what does that mean that we can do, to, uh, do today? Um, because, as Nicole said, the the, we're being intentionally challenging today by having created um, a home that is not really, they're not really real. I mean, people will not be dropped into 2023 from 2019. Uh, so we do have um, a, a several years to develop these services. Um, but first of all, what we've, what we've learned is that the idea of seamless payments in a connected home uh, does introduce a tension between convenience and control, between subconscious ne uh, love of getting things done and rational desire to make sure you don't go over budget or even to know, have concrete confirmation that a payment has been made. Um, so goods and money 
are going to flow more easily. Um, and we found that there was quite a degree of, of uh, uh, worry about losing control of spending. So the idea of, first of, um, and first of all, um, having the, I suppose, the, uh, uh, the uh, banking AP, um, API, the intelligent financial management to protect the transactions you're making by, uh, by voice, the transactions that increasingly your device will make on your behalf without you having to worry about, uh, about telling it, um, and also um, the longer term uh, goals and, spend, and spending opportunities, the financial management and coaching uh, to, uh, to help people manage their, uh, their budgets in a world where the rational agent is do, uh, doing a lot in the background. Um, secondly, we heard a lot about segmentation earlier on from a customer perspective. Um, we're also going to be needing to think about segmenting the type of experience, the type of voice and type of personality that we are using, uh, we are creating to interact with those customers. So there's a sort of customer segmentation meets, well, intelligent agent segmentation. What is the correct voice? What is the correct personality uh, in order to del uh, deliver, these, uh, del deliver these services? Um, and certainly in understanding how shopping is going to become far more goal orientated as more retail services uh, start to, uh, to plug in to the fabric of the connected home. Uh, so that is a little bit of a focus. Now I'm running short of time. We'll play this one. Uh, we are doing the meal planner together. So tomorrow night, we will organise our meal planner for the whole week and we'll sit and everyone gets to choose one night. That menu recipe ideas, what it's going to make us do is actually plan our meals, like meatball Mondays, taco mm -hmm. Tuesdays. Love that. <laughs> you, you, you don't see kids that excited about food now, do you? Uh -huh. We would select all. Yeah, can we have And then that? we've got to set it to our shopping list and send it to our meal planner. If I'm to make lasagna, um, I, I want nice sausages, I want um, I want the good beef, I want the good mince, uh, the pasta sauce, I don't want the no-name pasta sauce, I like to get you know, good pasta sauce and stuff like that. You know, now there's, a, there's an element of unknown here because you know, you've selected all and you're basically having to wait to see what you get. Select all premium would be all the premium brands, Click of a button, premium brands are getting delivered. What about select all suggested? Like Jamie Oliver recipe. And Jamie Oliver, you know, he's got a lot to do with Woolly, so he has his recommended products. I feel I changed brands when I did my online shop. Because I actually went by, I went by the half, the half price sales section to start off the shop. And everything that I did need and whatever was in there, I bought that. So this is more about our living rather than just Okay, let's go shopping at Woolworths. So you've got the goal to go to a destination, say Hawaii. You need to have Air New Zealand, Qantas, everything here because we mm. use Air New Zealand. And you need to be able to say, okay, we're kids, we're 50% away from buying our $6,000 tickets. You can also, again, visually see that the money's going in and we can see the graph increasing close to our goal. And everybody shares yeah. that experience, it's transparent. You know, they can see it and they'll be excited about it. So, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to just skirt over the final video, which was really just saying that this also makes people feel much better about themselves. The combination of many small uh, te technological changes in their homes actually has a psychological ben uh, benefit in how people view their homes and their, uh, their lives. So fundamentally, this third revolution in connectivity um, is going to be a revolution in expectations. Uh, we've seen how human experience of intuitive and connected technology is going to dramatically increase expectations across a range of lived experience. Um, voice is how people know that a device is smart. A home that's controlled by an intuitive agent. Uh, expect, you would expect that menial decisions are taken care of in the background for us. Uh, people are willing to share more data as long as it makes the agent smarter and more intuitive. Um, and once an agent is smarter, it can begin to provide um, those better living benefits of the third connected age. Um, so you know, we feel that this, this is roughly a home of 2023. Uh, clearly, people will 
not be dumped straight into it as these participants were, uh, but their insights uh, into the types of products, the types of services, and the modes of interaction uh, that, uh, that, that will win in that, uh, that type of uh, environment are hugely powerful insights uh, because they give us a bit of runway in order, to, uh, in, in order to factor into the products, the services that we're designing right now in order to be live in 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. Nicole, can I tell you, I've got one question for the both of you, if that's all right. Well, a quick question to you. When, when will my Google Mini Home make coffee for me? Is there a, we got a date on that? <laughs> uh, the, there are coffee machines already that are in the, in the States that will do it, but... Uh, it How does... excited would our guy burn if he'd had one of them? He was irrepressible. <laughs> quick question. As researchers, you would have both come to this as open-minded as possible. Give me one example of something that emerged from the project that surprised you, encouraged you, shocked you, scared you, something, but something that was not what you expected. I think for me, it's just, as you mentioned, it was just the pace at which the accelerations of expectations accelerated right off the charts. The coffee was a great example, um, but that really surprised me. We knew they'd increase, we just didn't know how fast. Graham, what caught you by surprise? Um, I think the power of voice. I mean, we knew that voice is, was going to be a really important part of the research. I think what we didn't expect was that it was so fundamentally different. And actually, when we saw the interviews coming back, it just made sense. I mean, you know, we've been talking as marketers for generations about word of mouth, except that what this kind of made, showed was that it doesn't have to be a mouth. It's the medium of conversation that people inherently trust. Okay, give Graham and Nicole from Starcom a big round of applause. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks. Julian, thank you so much for presenting that session. And in advance, thank you for the gifts you'll be receiving tomorrow.